My journey out of religion and the church was a long, tumultuous, and often confusing one, but it was ultimately the thing that I credit with saving my life and helping me come to a full understanding of who I was and who I am. And I think where my journey from religion differs from a good number of those who are also deconverted is that I wasn't introduced to evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins until a few years ago. My deconversion began by listening to YouTubers and outspoken voices in the community like Matt Dillahunty, Seth Andrews from The Thinking Atheist, dear god that voice, it is beautiful, <laughs> uh, Cirrus the Skeptic, Vice Rhino, Mr. Atheist, etc. They helped to kickstart the avalanche of realizations to my own childhood indoctrination and gave me the tools I needed to break out of the religious mindset and learn the difference between actual healthy human feelings and emotions and the things that the church used to control me and so many others. But when I was at last introduced to Richard Dawkins, boy did he leave an impact in many, many ways. Dawkins' primary claim to fame was his popularization of the idea that the gene is the primary driving force behind evolution, but he also gained notoriety by being a firebrand within the atheist community and one of the people who, along with Christopher Hitchens, helped to kickstart the modern atheist movements and bring a new awareness, especially to younger people, about how religion is used to manipulate, control, and abuse its followers. In his book, The God Delusion, Dawkins discusses how faith should be seen as a delusion, why you don't need a god or a holy book in order to be a good human being, and he elucidates on how Christians constructed the myth that emotions, gut instincts, your morals and behavior, and the mere desire to help others are all signs of God rather than just basic human instincts, brain chemistry, and the culmination of where we currently sit in our evolutionary timeline. The quote, there is something infantile in the presumption that somebody else has a responsibility to give your life meaning and points. Uh, the truly adult view, by contrast, is that our life is as meaningful, as full, and as wonderful as we choose to make it. And it really exemplifies how Christians have become infantilized and unable to function as their own independent beings, uh, sources of motivation and belief, and so on. They've been taught to fall in line, not question anything, and conform. Which sounds a bit authoritarian, doesn't it? Dawkins was a staunch advocate for rational thinking and the refusal to take anything at face value, and he certainly gained quite a bit of my respect and admiration early on. I appreciated his perfect balance between sassiness and classiness, his often gentle manner, and his ability to hold his own against even more of the ardent believers. And for a time, I naively sought to avoid any criticism of him and his words, believing that any minor slip-ups could be forgiven after all the work he'd done for newly freed heathens such as myself. But the more you learn about someone, the chances of finding something problematic become almost inevitable. As valued as Dawkins and his work are by myself and so many others in the atheist community, he suffers from a bit of foot-and-mouth disease, which isn't entirely surprising given he's from an older generation whose ideals don't really comfortably mesh with modern sensibilities. During an interview with Bill Maher, who himself is no stranger to controversy, Dawkins followed up on previous comments about Islam needing a feminist revolution by saying to hell with their culture while criticizing liberals who defended Islam. If we talk about them at all, or criticize at all, it's somehow hurting or humiliating Muslims. He argued it's a ridiculous idea. He'd also said in the past that all the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College and Cambridge. They did great things in the Middle Ages, though, as though to downplay and belittle their role in modern society. And are you a woman bored with life in the UK? Start a new life in our caliphate as a slave. If you change your mind, you can have a free beheading. You know, for someone of his stature, it's maybe not the best idea to flippantly say things like this with how volatile public attitudes are around the Muslim community. To sum up something I once read, to generalize 
is to dehumanize. Writer Gillian Brandstetter said in an article for The Daily Dot that there's a thin line between combating prejudice and creating more of it. I'm inclined to agree, even though I recognize that Christianity Islam and other belief systems were built on the preservation of oppressive hierarchies and outdated norms of behavior, gender roles, methods for learning about the world and one another, and that the world would 100% be a better place without it. When advocating for human rights and the abolition of these oppressive hierarchies, it's important to be inclusive of people from all different backgrounds while confronting and pushing back against any system that would seek to strip a person of their own autonomy. I think we sometimes forget that it's possible to do both. Dawkins' comments on Islam were merely the tip of the iceberg, however. In an exchange with another Twitter user, Dawkins said, if you want to drive, don't get drunk. If you want to be in a position to testify and jail a man, don't get drunk. When another user fired back with, I demand the right to get drunk as fuck and still not be violated, Dawkins said, of course that's your right, but don't expect a jury to take your word against his if you can't remember what happens. So here's another wealthy, older white man further perpetuating the ideals of rape culture and victim blaming because we haven't had enough of those already. On the topic of abortion, he said, with respect to those meanings of human that are relevant to the morality of abortion, any fetus is less human than an adult pig, and suggested that someone pregnant with a fetus that will be born with Down syndrome should abort it and try again, which is a horrifically ableist thing to suggest, and hints towards the idea that society would somehow be less pure if it were populated with people of a certain kind. In other words, eugenics. And speaking of eugenics, Dawkins really put the cherry on top of an already colorful past when he wrote a tweet recently that said, it's one thing to deplore eugenics on ideological, political, and moral grounds. It's quite another to conclude that it wouldn't work in practice. Of course it would. It works for cows, horses, pigs, dogs, and roses. Why on earth wouldn't it work for humans? Facts ignore ideology. First off, what he's describing is selective breeding, which is not exactly the same as eugenics. Selective breeding involves choosing parental organisms, which can be animals, vegetables, crops, flowers, with particular characteristics to breed together and produce offspring with more desirable characteristics. And humans have been using the process of selective breeding in order to produce better crops or raise farm animals that produce better quality meat or wool. Eugenics, on the other hand, means encouraging people of good health to breed in order to purify a species until only superior traits are seen in offspring, which is known as positive eugenics. It would also serve a purpose to end the proliferation of diseases and those who are neurodivergent or are in some way less able than the rest of the population, and these people in particular would be discouraged or even prevented from breeding as a whole. This is known as negative eugenics. But we get into some very sticky moral situations when we try to determine what exactly is superior. By what or whose predetermined standard are we holding these traits to? Are we going to ignore how many times throughout history History, these human-made predetermined standards of worth were used to reinforce harmful racial, social, and ableist hierarchies that paint those who fall outside of said standard as undesirable or a blight on society. That we are somehow being weighed down and kept from our true potential because of them. I think when most people hear the word eugenics, the first thing that comes to mind is Nazi Germany and their extermination of the Jewish people. Nazi eugenics were racially based social policies that placed the biological improvement of the Aryan race, also known as the Ubermenschen, at the very heart of their ideology. And even Hitler himself believes that his nation had become weaker as a result of dysgenics, or the introduction of degenerate elements into its bloodstream. 
Whenever Dawkins talks about how we could breed humans to run faster or jump higher, there's certainly a parallel between his words and Nazi ideology, even if he later tried to backtrack by saying, well, heaven forbid we should actually do it. Some of the attacks against Dawkins that labeled him as a Nazi sympathizer or espousing Nazi ideals were perhaps a bit short-sighted in nature, though I think I see where they're coming from. I think we'd be better served by looking at how eugenics have been used throughout history to more fully understand why it's an incredibly dangerous thing to give credence to, no matter how you think it could be applied to modern humanity. Psychologist Henry Goddard wrote in his 1912 book, The Kallikak Family, that feeble-mindedness is a strongly heritable trait and a danger to democracy. This is also where ableist terms that describe hierarchies of intelligence like moron, imbecile, an idiot came from. And his work led to the creation of the intelligence quotient, or IQ test, that uses a number to determine one's mental abilities, despite the fact that intelligence is such an enormously complex thing that to boil it down to one number is to ignore the very nature of what it means to be human and place a numerical value on those who are more abled and less abled. The less abled are given less power and authority in society, while those who are more abled are, you know. And from the 20s onward, countless figures within and around the scientific community took the works of Darwin, Galton, Goddard, etc., and intertwined them with the pseudo-scientific beliefs of scientific racism, which is the belief that science can be used to determine the IQ and natural abilities of people depending on their racial or ethnic background. Notably lawyer and zoologist Madison Grant, who wrote a book called The Passing of the Greats, in which he claimed that Nordics, or his preferred type of whites, were being bred out of existence by other inferior types of whites. The idea of different variations within a race or even other races posing a threat to the gene pool of preferred peoples and demographic makeup of a culture or community is also present within the ideology of white supremacists. Now, we've heard people like Stefan Molyneux, Sargon of Akkad, and Paul Joseph Watson subtly or not so subtly, espouse the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, which is the belief that there is a deliberate plot to breed the white race out of existence through miscegenation, which is the interbreeding of people considered to be of different racial types, forced cultural assimilation, and unrestrained immigration of peoples from brown countries. What white supremacists and the three aforementioned YouTubers advocate for is very much at a foundational level what geneticists and scientists from the early 1900s advocated for, albeit in a much more overtly sinister way. And indeed the line between science and oppression that is rooted in ableism can sometimes be a hard one to trace. Scientific research itself has been born out of a desire to fix things that are themselves not inherently harmful. Some may feel that they're doing something virtuous by promoting ideas that unbeknownst to them are deeply harmful or have their roots in old outdated thinking, and others merely talk about these things in a bid for attention and anything that'll grab a headline or a hundred. Which brings me to the topic of idol worship or the placing of a public figure up on a pedestal and seeing them as infallible or justified in whatever they do. This obsessive devotion is very much cult-like in nature and can be seen nowadays with how people will fall over themselves to defend people ranging from Donald Trump to Ben Shapiro to Buck Angel and even Natalie Wynn, aka ContraPoints. You might be wondering what exactly the last two have to do with the rest of this video and it's basically this. The moment you take a god, a person, or ideology and you say that it's above criticism, you begin to develop reactionary tendencies, which is when we see people engaging in whataboutism and bad faith arguments towards those who are merely bringing attention to more problematic aspects of said god, person, or ideology. You also open yourself up to what I see as a cleansing of the self, or the dissolution of your own identity and willful conformity to a cause, merely because it gives you a sense of belonging, 
family, and purpose. For example, this is how the process of falling down the alt-right rabbit hole typically begins. But anyone can experience a sort of brainwashing of the self and not realize they're doing more harm than good by fighting for their golden calf, whatever it is. Richard Dawkins and ContraPoints both played important roles in my journey out of the church and my journey into understanding my identity as a trans woman, but I also acknowledge that the both of them deserve criticism for their history of problematic comments. And in Natalie's case, problematic alliances with people like Buck Angel, who routinely attacks non-binary and younger trans people, outed one of the Wachowski sisters, and more and more acts like your typical conservative YouTube reactionary, hello Blair White. We can acknowledge what they've done for their respective communities and causes, but under no circumstances does their advocacy mean that they are beyond reproach. When you're building a movement, particularly a leftist movement like ours, it's crucial that we aren't building any sort of social hierarchies or placing any one person above another, because in my mind this will automatically lead to more infighting, which the LGBTQ community is already dealing with enough of nowadays, and a halt in any coalition building or positive forward movements. We should lift certain voices up, but do so because it'll serve to rally everyone together and inspire us to stand together in solidarity for our common cause. It's true that we're all human and we all will make mistakes at some point, but we should be able to discern between those who are willing to learn and grow in understanding and those who are digging their heels in and tarnishing their own reputation in the process. You can turn your back on them, you can choose to no longer defend them, but maybe don't send them death threats. I feel like that might just be a few steps too far. Also, learn to think for yourself and never allow another soul to determine how you think. Even though I have some issues with the saying of if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, I think the sentiment is true in that having a nuanced approach to learning, understanding, and your own personal advocacy is critical to ensuring that we don't fall into black and white patterns of thinking. Human beings are, by their very nature, inextricably complex, and every single person on this planet holds a completely different understanding of things. Because we ourselves are not black and white beings, we should not treat each other in a black and white manner. Be open to criticism, be open to growth, and be open to the idea that, guess what? Not a single one of us will ever be right 100% of the time. And and that's okay. What matters is how we react when people bring attention to our actions. And that's gonna be it for this week's video. I hope y'all enjoyed. If you did, leave a like down below. If you wanna see more from me, hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you'll be notified for all of my future content. But until then, I love y'all. Take care of one another. Enjoy this precious thing called life that we have. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>